Welcome to Inroads, Rick. Yes. I am so honored to have you here. You have such an incredible story. You have really shaped so much of the way that the world views leadership, enterprise, women. You were, as a part of your service in the military, thank you for that, by the way, also, mm -hmm. knowing that you were a petty officer, seeing that that is a role that is very largely entrusted and connected to helping be in the trenches, working with people, right? building them up and making sure that their personal missions tie to the objectives. And you were front and center for that. Then you were working for Avon, leading Avon, then Tupperware. And I think that some of the impact that you've had is what we would love to be able to hear about on this podcast, your journey, why you chose some of the paths that you chose, what you think success means. And I can't wait to uncover all that. So thank you for Happy being to. here. It's good to be here too. So, Take me back to you at five years old. Yeah. If you were driving in a car with your five-year-old self right now, what would your five-year-old self be most surprised by to see where you are today and what you've done? Well, firstly, this sounds really shallow. I was the second shortest kid in my high school graduating class, and I'm 6'1 now. <laughs> and I had an eye that turned in up until I was, oh, I have seven eye operations all wow. through. My, my teens. So, so the first thing that would surprise me is, oh my God, physically, you're a little different <laughs> than, than, than you were then. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Yeah. But that's, I mean, that's very superficial, but it's, uh, it's, it, it was a blessing. Yeah. Yeah. I can imagine that. It's, yeah. If you were to ask back and you were to look back at that point, is, are you doing what you always thought you would do? Did you want to be this impactful to this many people across the world in this way? I didn't have that early on. I was raised in a you know, lower middle class, a father fought in the Second World mm -hmm. War, et cetera. I left home early. I left home at 16. It was oh, wow. difficult and challenging with regard to mm -hmm. issues there. And I would tell you, it, you know, it was a, early on, it was Maslow's hierarchy of needs, mm -hmm. food, clothing, and shelter, because uh, when I was... You know, I lived in a rooming house my senior year in mm -hmm. high school, and that was kind of unusual for most kids, yeah. particularly in Wheaton, Illinois. So I got very much used to early on accepting responsibility that mm -hmm. if it was going to be, it was up to me. Mm -hmm. And it is, it's wonderful once you start to take care of those things, mm -hmm. then you, as they move up, you can start really caring about other people. Yeah. Pretty much like they say in the airlines, put your mask on, yeah. but then help others. Yeah. So that once that really started to happen, and it's interesting, you mentioned Navy. First time I ever had leadership responsibility was in basic training, and I was made the platoon leader, and I already started to grow by that time. And then I was sitting there doing training of guys swimming across long swimming pools with the surface on fire. Wow. Uh, and I said, whoa, how did it get here? Yeah, yeah. And it started the momentum of every position I ever had. After that, I had responsibility for mm. other people, and I cherished it. Mm. What did you cherish most about it? The, the idea of, of having an impact on somebody else's life. Mm. Uh, it, it is interesting. I... Uh, just this Saturday morning again, uh, during COVID, one of my key guys, he's now in his mid-50s, his family, uh, he's Chinese, mm -hmm. and because of COVID lockdown, he didn't see his wife and children wow. for two years. They were in Australia, and there was mm -hmm. no allowing of, of it. Mm -hmm. And Saturday, so every week, uh, Saturday morning, 8 a.m., it was in Guangdong province. Mm -hmm. It was Saturday night for him. So for, you know, for really more than 100 weeks, every wow. single week, the joy you get from having impact on, on, on somebody's life, mm -hmm. it's just wonderful. And I would look at the people, you know, we did a, a study, we had a, the Global Fairness Initiative, mm -hmm. which is a nonprofit in Washington, do a study of our Tupperware businesses and the impact on women. And we picked two very different kind of countries. Okay. Mexico, Catholic, okay, but uh, you know, a, other than a few rich at the top, poor, 
and Indonesia, Muslim, 85% mm. Muslim. Uh, both of these were huge businesses mm -hmm. for us, more than 200,000 women in each. We wanted to see what would be the impact of what we were doing. Yeah. And the only prerequisite is they had to be with us three years. Okay. We found four things happened, or they did. It okay. was an independent. Number one, her attitude changed about herself. She used to have an attitude of, I'm not good enough. Mm. And now she had an attitude, I am good enough. Mm. And one third even said, I'm a leader. Wow. Second, she moved from lower class to middle class. Mm. Third, she became connected to other women with smartphones, computers. And when yeah. women are connected, that's power. Yeah. Last, the thing I'm most proud of in a world where one out of every three women is abused sometime in her life, he went from a belligerent attitude, the man to her life, sure. to actually supporting wow. her and being behind her. So the point mm -hmm. of saying, how can you not feel good about that? That yeah. you, you left something behind and you do something yeah. that it adds benefit other than shareholder value. Yes. So, and I'm going to come back to that shareholder value because I have a very specific question about that as it relates yeah. to the impact that you've had. But I'm going to take it back to the women part. I'm imagining that you came into Tupperware at a point where it's a manufacturing type distribution company and there's a lot of metrics and KPIs and processes and compliance and that's how it was run previously. You chose to elect a very different model, meaning you put people first, especially women, and it soared from that point. Am I recalling that correctly? Is there is that a good summation of the story and the journey at the beginning when you first came in to Tupperware? Yeah, that is correct. I mean, you you got it. That's <laughs> what it was. The you know when you come into a turnaround situation, the first thing you've got to have to look at is what have I got to work with here? Yeah. And then you ask yourself the question, what what differentiates this company and gives it competitive advantage. Mm -hmm. Making burping bowls, that was, I mean, Rubbermaid uh, really got into a lot of, of a competitor of, of, of Tupperware by the time I got there. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people said to me, well, you got to go head to head with Rubbermaid. And I said, I think not. Mm -hmm. We're going to go where they can't go. And what we found out what differentiated Tupperware Firstly, was our selling method. And okay. it was, we didn't have to spend of our value chain from, from cost of goods sold to retail, a bunch of money on giving it to a retailer mm -hmm. or, or on advertising. That's where mm -hmm. we said, we're going to spend that will go to showing women how to be entrepreneurs and building mm -hmm. her own business so that she would share the product with her friends, mm -hmm. neighbors, and relatives. And you know, when people have asked, you know, when I, as, even as I left, they said, are there still Tupperware parties? <laughs> yeah, every 1.1 1 .1 second yeah. job there is. And what it is, is she would share the product mm -hmm. uh, with, her, with her friends, uh, neighbors. She would demonstrate how it works and she would receive the compensation that usually went to a bricks and mortar in a store. Yeah or they went to the networks and, and advertising. Mm -hmm. So it was a redeployment to her. Mm -hmm. And that's what really helped her start to say, oh my goodness, I, I can, can do, do this. this. Yeah. Yeah. I can do this. Now, at the same time, we really had to differentiate products. So I had our product development people. Focus was, I want 25% of sales to be from new products mm -hmm. every single year. So I said, do products that need and should be demonstrated so that use shows mm. results. Mm -hmm. And we created more of those. And well, Rubbermaid could knock off those kind of products, but they were sitting on the shelf of a Walmart yeah. and people didn't know what they were. So we could go and we could go to more expensive ingredients. Sounds mm -hmm. like Papa John's, but we <laughs> We went to highly engineered resins. That's why when they were doing the International Space Station, they came to us about how would you do this? How would wow. you adapt this so that we could grow things in outer space? So that so and what it did was it helped her yeah. better because she had something unique. Yeah. Okay. High quality. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. really. And, and you know, you never see Tupperware in a garbage dump. Yeah. Yeah. There's and there's something that that you did 
that Rubbermaid or others often either miss or can't do or undervalue. And that is leverage the power of connectivity of people, alignment among them, yeah. and how when they share with one another, there is a force multiplier there. And so they couldn't buy that network or they couldn't buy those relationships. They couldn't compete with what has otherwise been created among those groups of women. That is a definite unique differentiator. And so why women? Oh, <laughs> firstly, they're the ultimate communicator. Their primary consumer out there everywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, too. That's what people have asked me. Well, why, why do you invest more in women? I said, if you show a woman how to make income, she'll spend 90 percent of what she makes on her family mm -hmm. and her community. Mm -hmm. Men spend the bulk on themselves. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, I can see that. She mm -hmm. thinks we, mm -hmm. he normally, it's a, you know, machismo mindset. He thinks me. Mm -hmm. And so uh, you know, I've got a, a friend, he's back at the uh, New York Times, Nick Kristoff, who's one of the great writers in this country. He and his wife, Cheryl Wudung, wrote a book called Half the Sky. And the whole concept is women hold up half the sky. Mm -hmm. And so... It really became important to me early on to leverage the power of of women yeah. because and not for social justice, because the moment you just say that you're saying, well, it's because it's not fair. No. How about it's dumb yeah. not to leverage the power of women? And that's what I would promote at uh, the many years I was involved leading that effort yeah. at the World Economic Forum at Davos. Mm. Oh, yeah, that's right. That is a, such an incredible conference and wonderful stage for you to be on sharing your story, too, I imagine. With the idea that you raised entrepreneurial women, there was development, succession planning. Were you acquiring locations or were you building? How were you helping them with their point of entry and the leadership of their distribution areas? Well, we basically, the key is come up with a formula that is a a uh, replicable formula mm -hmm. where she can go out there and become a reader, repeater station. Okay. Now, m my first focus was getting the U.S. business back on track mm -hmm. uh, again, getting, because they had manufacturing people running the company. Yeah, right. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and what builds a direct selling company, uh, particularly a company uh, of, of women, contact, competition, and mm -hmm. recognition. Mm -hmm. And we brought back... Gosh, it was fun again. I got recognition. Wow. I started to earn money again. I got to, my goodness, I never had a passport. And look at all the places now uh, that I've been. So the, the key elements that support that, mm -hmm. we did it here. But simultaneously, from me living and working in Europe mm -hmm. during my Avon years and in Hong Kong and Asia mm -hmm. and having responsibility for all that, I said, there's less than 5% of the world's population lives here in the U.S. Hmm. Let's get this, let's get a focus uh, elsewhere in the world. So, I mean, that's why as I left Tupperware, it was, I think, 93% of our sales were outside wow. the U.S. Because that's where the people are. Yeah. Wow, that's fascinating to think. I mean, imagining you coming in. You've got this environment that's manufacturing. You are uncovering and recognizing not only location and market implications or advantages, you're breaking into them. You're taking the recognition and the focus on the employee. You're also then therefore focusing on women empowerment and the distribution of their own wealth into their families and the community. That's a lot of change and a lot of headwinds. What were the conversations like in the boardroom? Was your team aligned with you? Did you have to make some tough decisions? Tell me about those conversations when you were making these moves. Well, firstly, I've got to say I was blessed by those years having an incredible board. And we brought oh. on people to really help that were really experienced, people who got it. Mm. They said, gosh, this really does make sense. Very, very bright uh, mm. people. Okay. I started to make a diversity on our board mm. a a real key. So there's, as I left, 50% of the board were women wow. uh, as well. And they came in from different areas. But what I'm really proud of is the years before I got there, the company was stumbling and not because they had people that were incapable, mm. 
I had to replace very few people. Wow. They just needed direction and leadership and hope hmm. uh, for it. So, I mean, there was, gosh, I remember when I did the turnaround for Avon in Germany, the only person I had to replace of my senior management team was the lawyer, wow. was the corporate lawyer. The other people mm. had been there. They were tired of losing. We, and, you know, initially I couldn't speak German. Mm. And some of them, one, oh, my former CFO just passed away this last year, Fritz Hassemuller. He wrote me an incredible note and he said, Rick, those two years were the best years wow. of my life and of my business life. Because what we did is we took a company, it was a hundred and some million when we first got there, but it was declining like mad. And within, within a year, we were going from down 20% to up 25%. And then another year of up 25%. It feels good to be on a, on a winning yeah. team. And they were good. Th those people weren't, I mean, I remember our, uh, the slogan in, uh, in German, it was Stolzer Tradition Leicht in Zukunft, which means proud tradition, bright future. Huh. And it's those same kind of elements that uh, it's easy to come in and criticize that ah, it's the people that are that are here. I've often believed this. There's no such thing as a lazy person. There are uninspired people. Ah, yeah. I like that. Yeah. 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 And people, all things being equal, they'd rather see trips fly yeah. uh, and they'd rather say, I can make a difference yeah. uh, on it so that you know, I got great support at Tupperware you know, coming and, and those people, and they grew. And then yeah. I shipped them all over the world. Yeah. And that, yeah. So you tapped into what was inherently already a very raw potential and you aligned it and you created this more of a visual path to what their success would be. They saw it, they bought into it, you encouraged them, you rewarded them. And so Focusing on that alignment of the team connected to your strategy seems like it was one of your winning methods of going in to do that. Yeah. Well, do you know what's interesting on that, Kara? It's a, it's a great point. Business formulas, yeah. templates matter. Look, all through the 20th century, people, Americans particularly, were eating hamburgers. Mm -hmm. Okay. Why didn't Dairy Queen or Tasty Freeze, why didn't they become McDonald's? Mm. And what Kroc figured out as he watched these two brothers in San Bernardino and Riverside, they had a formula and it, it was consistency so that they mm. have often said, you come up with a what you think is a strategy or plan, mm -hmm. you launch it in a learning laboratory, mm -hmm. you then fix or refine it, mm -hmm. and then you scale it. Mm -hmm. What Kroc was uh, able to do was to get that template. That's what I, early on, I observed what's working, what mm -hmm. gives us competitive advantage. And then all you had to do that is replicate that in mm -hmm. France, mm -hmm. replicate that in Germany, mm -hmm. take it to China. But you had to also adapt and adopt to what those cultures yes. uh, are. You know, France is a baking mm -hmm. country. Germany's a cooking mm -hmm. uh, con country. And you know, so we we adapt it and adopt it. And yeah. by, by the way, we did some things that Steve Jobs did when he w came back to Apple, he basically, you took the hub of, uh, of what he had in back then, in just the laptop. And all he could make early on was design changes. But then he had, if you took hub and spokes, flanker mm. categories mm. out of it. And we, you know, the rest is history yeah. of, uh, it took five years, then he had the had the, uh, the iPhone, the iPad, the blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Okay. We were food storage mostly when I got there. I looked for the, where are the flanker categories? Uh, and people hmm. who were product development, who worked with us, just, I mean, they're the ones who made me look smart. I mean, it's interesting. <laughs> I got to know Fred Smith, who started Fed Express. And Fred once said to me, the way to really look smart is find a good parade and get in front of it. <laughs> That's and awesome. So I had these great people. And so we started to say microwave. Only thing people are using microwaves for right now are heating liquids or reheating something. Wow. We said, there's a whole way to do it and new and different ways. And we said, hmm, 
we came up with a whole new category uh, of things. Mm -hmm. Eco. God, water bottles. This is the in Asia, the biggest pollute. These are blow molded water bottles. The half-life of these, these don't disintegrate for 1,000 years. Wow. You ought to see the river in Indonesia with bottles like this floating. We said, hey, we're going to come up with bottles that people don't throw away. And mm. are, we, don't, we don't believe in single use right. of, of, mm -hmm. of plastic. So the different categories mm -hmm. that we went into, uh, it was amazing. And uh, people loved having it from Tupperware. Wow. Yeah. We'd like to have that. So that was the brand recognition at that point, too. Yeah. How, when you think about other people, like you brought up Rubbermaid, and, and there are other companies that try to compete in whatever space they exist in, where do you think leaders get it wrong? Yeah. Well, I think one place they get it really wrong is low-cost supplier mm -hmm. is generally you'll bring in somebody who's got, you know, they've got the right degrees and they come in there, they started it from product mm. manufacturing, and they, they're going to come out, and rather than product differentiation, mm -hmm. they'll go to a low-cost supplier. Mm -hmm. That is an expensive strategy, mm. and it doesn't last long, mm -hmm. because there's always going to be somebody else that's going to come in mm -hmm. and do it a little bit yeah. cheaper yeah. Uh, on that. I believe where they get it wrong is they don't differentiate their products in areas where people really will pay the difference mm. uh, mm -hmm. for it. Mm -hmm. So it, it's interesting, uh, it, as, as we look at uh, Amazon, mm -hmm. uh, I was saying this at graduate business schools early, early on when they were just initially just doing books and opening yeah. it up. I basically would talk to people, I said, they are a logistics company mm -hmm. and watch what happens. Uh, with this. So they got the distribution model down. And so they won by distribution mm -hmm. of it. And that's where, you know, the other booksellers started yeah. to go broke because it was distribution mm -hmm. was what their leverage uh, was. For us, it was product differentiation, mm -hmm. demonstration, mm -hmm. and then driven by the power of women. Yeah. I, so this is the quote that I read that I wanted to expand on a little bit or ask if you would expand on. That you were an early proponent and outspoken advocate in redefining the role and purpose of business from the near myopic focus on shareholder value. Yeah. Tell me more about that. Uh, for, there was a subject that uh, there were some arguments with certain members of our board who basically say, hey, as board members, we're paid by shareholders. Mm -hmm. We want to, we believe everything ought to be first for shareholder value. Mm -hmm. Early on, I felt that was wrong. Uh, it's interesting. A group of us, I think they had, we had 60 of us fortune executives. Francis had just been made Pope. We convened a meeting, and I'm more Buddhist than anything <laughs> else. So this is, I'm Catholic, okay? But what a one, lovely man. And he was talking about the responsibility of all of us to help others. Mm. So we convened a meeting at the Vatican that really talked about the shift mm. from shareholder value, which really came out of University of Chicago and Kellogg Business School in the 60s. Yeah. Okay. To it's got to be stakeholder value because stakeholders are starts out with Mother Earth. Mm. Okay. Nothing matters if we don't take care of this ball we, mm -hmm. we live on. The communities we serve, the individuals who are consumers, the sellers. The, so the, the whole responsibility of that. And so we, we met and he actually, he, he sat there with us for an afternoon wow. as we discussed this whole thing. And it came out within two years ago that business is shifting now to stakeholder value. Let me tell you why that makes so much sense. Yeah. The, when in the, all that came out in the 60s, mm -hmm. shareholder value, the average holding period for a share of stock in a public company was between seven and eight years. Mm -hmm. The average holding right now, six to seven months. Wow. Why would you be answering to somebody 
who's a temporary, who's a renter <laughs> right, uh, yeah. of your stock. What do they want to do? They want to maximize now. Yeah. Now, which means taking bad decisions, mm. not caring as much about making short term decisions mm -hmm. that can have long term negative Im impact. Mm -hmm. It's it's a balance. So if I am an investor right now and I am looking at acquiring a company or looking at putting my money and beliefs into something. I think a lot of people do think in terms of return or return on that investment or what the inherent value is or you know, where that's going and when that's going to come back to them. How would they feel about this kind of a shift from your perspective? Well, the really smart ones, if you look at Warren Buffett, he got, you know, he, his investments have been with companies with often products he liked to use mm. where they weren't a spike uh, mm. uh, on mm -hmm. what they were doing. Because what happens with companies that are more short term mm -hmm. uh, uh, in their thinking with, with regard to this, you have to make two decisions, when to buy the stock mm -hmm. and when to sell it. Mm -hmm. If you make the right decisions uh, and get into the companies that have a foundation of these kinds of values mm -hmm. and the tone uh, of the organization, then the then the power of compounding takes yeah. place. You know, I often uh, tell young execs that are 30 years old, they say, well, give me an example of the power of compounding mm -hmm. on investing. I said, rather than stock picking, I said, at 30 years old, start putting away 15,000 a year. Just figure out a way to 15,000 a year. Mm -hmm. Do that for 30 years. You'll have 450,000 that will be put away but in normal returns uh, in the market out there, mm -hmm. what will your investment portfolio be, be worth? 1.5 million. Mm. The other million came from pound compounding mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, off that. That's what smart investors mm -hmm. do uh, asset allocation mm -hmm. approach and they diversify and they pick companies that have sustainability to them. So it's, I think it's only smart. Yeah, absolutely. And I hear a theme also of the people, whether it's the consumer, whether it's the leadership team, whether it's the talent within the organization. When you talk about the foundation, the people are a cornerstone of that, right? And so oh. you can have a business plan, you can have a certain PL, you can have a certain process that's operations, you can have a certain you know, compliance and legal regulatory aspects that are valuable, but if you don't get that foundation of people right. It's, it, it's everything. At the core of it, all a company is, it's such an important point you've made, Carrie, all a company is, is a collection of people. That's at its mm -hmm. core. Forget where it's got manufacturing and it makes this and uh, does does that. That that can change and will change mm -hmm. if you have the right people and they're empowered. I've got to tell you, uh, probably one of the most important personal feelings of satisfaction that I had is um, I never had a direct report at Avon or at Tupperware quit and go wow. somewhere else. Never. Wow. And call it luck. But I will tell you, what we tried to do is create an operating environment mm -hmm. where they were empowered. Mm -hmm. Firstly, because when we recruit somebody good, uh, I believe the stars can't shine until the sun goes down. Mm -hmm. So I don't micromanage. Yeah. Uh, we agree on the strategy, like mm -hmm. empower them, give them responsibility, mm -hmm. reward them, mm -hmm. and keep moving them up mm -hmm. uh, in the organization. And so I look back and and the ones who got to certain points in their life, they said, I never believed I would be here. Yeah. And I didn't do it. They did it. They did it, right? Yeah. yeah. I, you just all I tried to do was bit. working with them, facilitate yeah. creating a, a, a culture. You know, Peter Drucker, I've been on the Drucker was a uh, an Austrian, although he wrote in this country and taught in this country. The most important thing Drucker ever said was that culture eats strategy for breakfast. Mm -hmm. And you try to create that. So what's fascinating, I've been curious as I think a lot of leaders as they're looking at their strategic plans, looking at the economic state of the world and watching what's happening to the stock market, watch what's happening in the investor capital space, uh, the alternative capital space. 
looking at what's happening with M&A, with companies that are trying to raise capital in various stages. There's a lot happening with money shifting around the world, certain industries and sectors that their sustainability, for example, the ESG, they're yeah. moving into these areas that are somewhat recession proof. My question for you is, oftentimes the diligence process, when there are decisions being made about where all this money is going to go, which impacts all of us, our whole future, right? Uh, depending on whatever company it is that they're going to buy, grow, scale, that impacts all of us, just the same way you did through Tupperware. When they do the due diligence process and they're making their investment thesis and or their investment decision, they're focusing on the finances and they're focusing on the operations. Why, in your opinion, do you think they, it's not often talked enough about the people? That's changing. I am so happy that it's changing. And it's interesting, Google, technology company, yeah, uh, Alphabet, and it's interesting, they did a study, I think it's been four years, and they, they did this study, it was called Oxygen. Okay. And they wanted to study our growth of managers hmm. at Google. They know that's what gives them competitive advantage, having really competent mm -hmm. managers and people. And they tried to distill it down to what are the ingredients that are important to us. You would think as a tech company, that would be all these technical yeah. aspects. You had to get to number eight before rank and file mm. associates at Google started to say, my manager was good at teaching me technical aspects mm. of my job. Everything else was about things that we often talked about, soft, mm. that were soft, but they're not soft. If you, I mean, you show individuals how to become the best version of themselves yeah. and to become invested in, in them, mm -hmm. that's going to be more powerful, particularly if you, if you buy into the notion that all a company is, is a collection of people. Yeah. Then you say, okay, I'm going to attract the best people, empower them, give them you know, uh, development mm -hmm. opportunities and reward them, voila, mm -hmm. that becomes a formula. I, I think more and more, but it isn't, it generally isn't talked about enough, but I will tell you in business school these days, We're it's getting more. talked about a lot more. So we'll make this the, one of the final questions, but I wanna give you a little bit of context because I think I could really use your advice on this. And expect to take it this way, but I'm just going to be back to vulnerability. I'm just going to ask. Okay. I've gone through very early in my career working in manufacturing technology software, a lot of male dominated industries. I've often been the youngest and the only female. You can imagine what that was like in those spaces. But I learned that even though my skill and gift and education was in HR, I had to learn the finance piece and the operations piece because I had to lead with credibility so that I wasn't judged on being the only female or being young. I also had to work on relationships and influence in order to be able to rise. I accomplished that. I was able to also get to the C-level pretty quickly. I brought three companies public, have done international mergers and acquisitions all over the world. What I found is in entrepreneurial companies, there is a magic. There's just some kind of magic when it comes to if you can take the talent, like we've been talking about, of the organization, and you can structure them in the ways that we've been talking about, the value to the communities, to the company, to the industries overall, it's profound. And as I've gone through my journey, I realized those that are putting money into other companies or those that are acquiring other companies, every time I was at a deal table, they nobody talked about the talent. Nobody talked about how they work together. Nobody talked about and asked questions about the succession plan or the high potential of who's next once the founder or CEO wants to move on. And so I started Carrie Lane Executive Solutions on the idea that in this space, there is a lot of opportunity to make a very big impact and difference. If I could change the way investors see investing, if I could get them to focus as a core part of the due diligence process, people, relationships, connectivity, alignment, execution, as well as finance and operations. So if you were me, and this was your mission, you wanted to go change the way people saw investing so that you could impact all of those people that are out there that have such wonderful teams or needing to have emphasis on building strong teams so that they can have happy employees that have happy communities. What, what would you, what would you how, how should I look at that? What would you say or what would you do if you were me? What advice do you have? Well, it's interesting, you're going back to, um... Remember the book, um, Good to Great? Yeah. And one of the things he really, he's a good guy. One of the things he dissected, though, 
with the operating landscapes mm-hmm. and, uh, and, and companies. Mm-hmm. And I think communications is a key piece. Mm-hmm. It, it is interesting when you talk about not only women's empowerment, but for HR, it was for, for years, the only ways to get to the top for, but not the top, to yeah. get to the C-suite was through one of the R jobs. Mm-hmm. HR, PR, IR. Oh, those are jobs, the machismo, those are jobs for women yeah. because they generally don't. Mm-hmm. To, but more and more are starting to understand, oh my goodness, particularly, particularly HR, mm-hmm. at the very core of it is, it's understanding the role of people. And if that's why I would tell you, What I tried to do, and then I'll get to your question, early on in leadership development is when we would see somebody in their, call it their early to mid thirties, Mm -hmm. and they were in a functional area. Let's say HR, I would try to pull them out and get their ticket punched Mm -hmm. in other areas, marketing Mm -hmm. and general management, Sometimes in general, I wouldn't put them in finance, mm. though, although that, that, it was not because they weren't capable. I felt they were more front facing mm-hmm. uh, if they were one, yeah, in, in, in mm-hmm. marketing or in strategy. Mm. I just want this one dynamic. And when she, I was just so she used to be with us at Tupperware. Most of the people are gone who are there mm. with me. But she's now been made a a senior VP in strategy with a huge uh, company. And I'm so proud of her. And I remember when we did the the, the pivot. I think you really need to use case histories Mm -hmm. of the sustainable companies Mm -hmm. and what were the ingredients that used Mm -hmm. that made it work Mm -hmm. for them. Mm -hmm. You can see it a lot on Wall Street, too, that the ones that are able to keep people for Mm -hmm. the longest it isn't the firms that grind them out because they usually leave and go yeah. try to start their own things. I, I just think you've, it's got to be brought more forward. Mm-hmm. We have more examples of it. I can tell you, I'm, I'm on the board of about, got five Bessemer Trust funds. Mm-hmm. Bessemer Trust, by the way, the money behind early on, the, he was the CFO, Henry Phipps, for Andrew Carnegie. Mm-hmm. And it's a private bank. Mm-hmm. We were the money that went to Bain that was behind Google, oh, wow. uh, Facebook, mm-hmm. Uber. We were the early investors wow. in that. And we, when we make investments in those kind of things, we're looking at people because they're small. And then you start to look at the operating mm. styles uh, of those kinds of people. For sustainability, it's going to be critical in the future to find those cultures, in fact, Mm -hmm. that put the right emphasis on people. Yeah, I love it. I and that is very encouraging for me. Thank you. As somebody that's starting out in this, I sometimes wonder, I get nervous, right? And I I think I just I don't want to give up because I believe in the mission and I believe in the impact. And I know I'm doing it still in a male dominated space. So I'm still shaking trees with like elbow in my way in. But I believe in it. And that's why that whole team is out there. They believe in it. And I think that there is such a difference and an opportunity. And so it is very encouraging to me to hear your stories yeah. and where your you're Your time in, in HR training was not a waste. It was a foundation yeah. uh, of it. You can hire people to run the numbers, yeah, but you got to have the people yeah. uh, to do it. Yeah. And that's the great replicator out there. Yeah. It's true. It, it worked for me. That's awesome. And you yeah. have such great evidence of that. To your point, the case studies, you are a great example of what can happen when you do that. So yeah. Thank you. Thank you for joining us and for being on. It was a pleasure. I really loved having you here. A fun conversation. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Thank you.